Chapter 2. Delusion. Everything you know is wrong. The science fiction film The Matrix is primarily entertainment, but the premise with which it begins is a great metaphor for our era. In the world depicted by the film, nearly all of humanity is asleep and plugged into a great computer that, for reasons of its own, manufactures a shared dreamed reality for the humans a reality that is quite similar to the reality in which you and I live. That dream is called the Matrix by the few people who were awake and rebelling against the computer. Early in the film, a young sleeper called Neo takes the red pill and is thereby awakened, and it's a tremendously wrenching experience. The real world turns out to be vastly different from the dream. Of course, the Matrix is only a metaphor. Here are four important differences between Neo's world and ours. First, in the film, Morpheus says to Neo, Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. And he gives Neo a pill that begins the awakening. Here in our world, the awakening may begin with some shocking event that jolts you out of your complacency, perhaps in the world news, or perhaps something purely personal. Or it may begin with someone gently telling you where to look, as I'm attempting to do now. But that telling only begins the process. Ultimately, you do have to see for yourself that reality is vastly different from what you thought it was. In Neo's world, the dreaming is altogether involuntary, but in our own world, to varying degrees, the sleepers are collaborators in perpetuating the delusion, and so it has been called the consensus trance by some activists. Many of our sleepers are in denial and do not want to be awakened. They would rather believe that everything is fine. One reason for that is because awakening would set them apart from their friends. Another reason is that awakening would confront them with problems that are too great and terrifying. They would prefer not to be aware that they are being screwed, since they feel they can't do anything about it anyway. At this point in my transcript, I'm including a link to Susan Rosenthal's book, Power and Powerlessness. She describes this denial as an instance of the Stockholm Syndrome. Third, in Neo's world, the awakening is all or nothing. Here in our own world, the awakening may be in stages, because one may be deluded separately about several different topics, such as war, climate change, the economy, or the possibilities in human nature. My own awakening, my own departure from common knowledge, began in early 2006. This essay covers some of what I've learned since then. Admittedly, there are some people who believe that all the ills of the world come from just one evil conspiracy, and thus only one all-or-nothing awakening is required. But personally, I think they're mistaken. If one small group really was in charge, they'd be doing a better job of it, instead of destroying the planet they own. But I could be wrong about that. Fourth, in the world of the Matrix, all of physical reality is dreamed. Clothing, cars, buildings, and so on. In our own world, physical reality in the present time is real. A car is actually a car, and so on. But our world's consensus trance alters a couple of things other than our physical reality. Those things can't be depicted visually, so perhaps a cinematic metaphor closer than the film The Matrix is not possible. Here are the two things or kinds of things that I see altered by our consensus trance. First, our trance alters history. For instance, many people in our society still believe that nuking Japan expedited the end of World War II, or that the Gulf of Tonkin incident actually happened, or that Iraq really did have weapons of mass destruction in 2003. Second, and more subtly, but perhaps more importantly, our consensus trance misdirects our interpretation of the significance of events, that is, the models through which we interpret the subjective parts of reality, 
as I discussed in the previous chapter. I'll discuss that in more detail now. Our corporate communications media are consolidated into ever fewer hands, particularly ever since the Powell Memorandum of 1971. Thus, the media offer us only a very narrow range of interpretations of events, and only a very narrow range of models of how we might understand our lives, how we might relate to each other, and how we might choose to live. For instance, the following assumptions are often implicit in the way that both news stories and entertainment stories are presented to us. Our economic system is fair, and furthermore it's the only system possible. Sane people are moderates who would make only tiny modifications to the status quo. Anyone else is a crazy extremist. Global warming might be a problem, but not an urgent one, so don't panic. Periods of high unemployment and low wages are inevitable and temporary, like the rain. There's nothing you can do about it but wait. Terrorists are a grave danger to us, and so the war on terror makes sense. And our soldiers have only fought in wars that were unavoidable and noble. Have you accepted those assumptions, perhaps without even being consciously aware of them? They are invisible, unnoticed, and unquestioned as the air we breathe. We are surrounded by deceptions. Some are entirely conscious and intentional. For instance, for many years the tobacco companies knew quite well that cigarettes caused cancer, but they denied and concealed that information because it would have cut into their profits. Other deceptions may be much less conscious and intentional. Newscasters and other public figures simply repeat falsehoods that they have been led to believe true, or omit truths that they have been led to believe are nonsense. The corporate news media, to save time and money, have cut down on fact-checking, and they simply present any controversy in a she-said-he-said -said fashion, as though all opinions deserve equal respect and legitimacy, without any concern about whether one of them might be a lie. These news media are easy prey for a situational science men, depicted here in the Doonesbury cartoon. Some politicians don't even attach much importance to truth. When Senator John Kyle recently was caught lying about Planned Parenthood, his office said that his remark, quote, was not intended to be a factual statement, end quote. In Orwell's novel, 1984, loyal members of the party would echo the party line even when it changed, and train themselves to not consciously notice that their own beliefs had just changed. Some lies have very serious consequences. Millions of people have died, and many millions more have had their lives utterly wrecked by wars started with lies. And lying about the destruction of the ecosystem may eventually lead to the extinction of the entire human race. It's difficult for most of us to think about these things. We don't want to believe that anyone could do such monstrous things and tell such monstrous lies. But that's just what the monsters are counting on. That's why the biggest lies sometimes are the most convincing ones. Hitler himself explained that. He called it the big lie. Of course, he wasn't describing himself at the time. He was describing the Jews. He was telling a big lie about the big lie. Keep in mind that Hitler was the same species as you and me. Some of our own political leaders might lie in a similar fashion. Are we doing anything to prevent that? Politicians promise transparency in government, but those same politicians increase government secrecy, supposedly for reasons of national security. I think that the people in power who are willing to commit such atrocities are psychopaths. They are very sick. We need to get them out of power and into mental hospitals. Later I'll say a little more about what might be motivating them. But what about the rest of us? Some of my fellow activists complain angrily and bitterly about a nation of sheep. But I think their anger is not productive, nor is their sheep metaphor. Let me suggest a different metaphor. 
The propaganda all around us is like a sleeping potion that has been slipped into our food without most people being aware of it. And so they're difficult to awaken, but we shouldn't be angry at them for that. We simply have to keep trying to wake them. And here's a picture of Dorothy, who fell asleep in a field of poppies en route to the Wizard of Oz. How is our matrix structured? Here's a diagram from Daniel C. Hallen's 1986 book, The Uncensored War, the Media and Vietnam. Hallen described three categories of concepts. Consensus, the innermost zone, contains those concepts that everyone in the news media would accept without question and would assume implicitly without even mentioning. Deviance, the outermost zone, contains those concepts that the news media would either ignore entirely or ridicule as crackpot notions. And the intermediate zone of legitimate controversy contains those issues that the newscasters actually consider to be worth discussing. The boundaries set by the news people generally have been accepted by the public, since the public has had no other sources of information. Lately, the Internet has begun to change that. Ironically, most of the press is unaware of their role as gatekeepers, and so the Helen diagram itself is actually a deviance concept. Noam Chomsky was talking about the sphere of legitimate controversy when he said, The smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum. He has also said that the corporate media rarely offer him a speaking platform, and they justify this by accusing him of a lack of concision, that is, by claiming that he can't make his points briefly enough. And they're factually correct in that assertion, though they attach the wrong significance to it. To express any unconventional idea, we must struggle to find the words, and it takes more time than conventional ideas do, so it won't fit between two commercials. Most people in our society are largely unaware of any ideas in the sphere of deviance, even though that might be where the truth is. As Thomas Pynchon said, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. The positioning of topics can occasionally change, generally either through the efforts of many ordinary individuals or through the efforts of one or a few celebrities. For instance, almost single-handedly, the celebrity Al Gore moved global warming nearly all the way from deviance to consensus, through the stages that Gandhi listed. We climate activists have been ignored, then laughed at, then fought with, and now we've almost won. But politicians rarely exhibit such leadership. More often they stick to safe positions. And so we activists must struggle to bring to light many taboo subjects that have been relegated to the sphere of deviance. We must have the courage to say things that no one else is talking about things that get us labeled as crackpots.